Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Barron. I'm here to talk to you about RWX storage for container orchestrators with CephFS in Manila. Um, I work um, have for a few cycles now as the uh, project team, team leader for the OpenStack Manila project. Um, and I work at Red Hat downstream. Um, I've worked there on um, coordinating Ceph as a back end with Ganesha, as in the previous talk. Uh, we're still running active passive, and we want to go towards what Patrick and uh, Jeff just described. Um, and I'm also working currently on how to integrate uh, OpenShift, which is Red Hat's uh, Kubernetes extension platform, and um, the upstream container storage interface um, to extend Manila beyond OpenStack to provide what Kubernetes calls RWX storage for container orchestrators. I used to work in a bunch of other places. Um, this is my contact info. Uh, you can reach me on IRC and you can reach me by email. Um, I'm happy to follow up with people. Um, what we want to talk about today is uh, read write mini stories for containers using CephFS and Manila. Um, and my thesis, as it were, you can take it as a conversational gambit. We're all trying to figure out how to uh, integrate different clouds creatively and make things work and do it in a cool way. Um, so my thesis, uh, for the sake of argument at least, is that uh, OpenStack Manila can orchestrate CephFS so that it can play a useful role uh, for container workloads uh, outside OpenStack proper. So we'll talk about OpenStack and container orchestrators as cloud, cloud providers, differences between them, and look at storage infrastructure for containers, um, the CSI interface, uh, read-write mini storage, and Ceph and CephFS via CSI on the one hand, and then look at Manila um, from the OpenStack world and how um, Manila can work with CephFS today, um, both with an NFS front end and native, um, and with um, forthcoming, upcoming Manila CSI work. Um, and talk a little bit, if we have time, about some of the ongoing work uh, my group is doing, uh, which is pretty much it's out in the open, and we'd like to invite other people that are interested to participate. So when I think about um, um, cloud services, um, I also think about different personas. Who's the cloud administrator and who's the cloud user in terms of these personas? Um, they're personas that have been with me through my career, at least, um, when I worked at uh, I worked at the University of Chicago managing labs for um, some applied mathematicians and, and computer scientists. And among that group of people, there were end users. Everybody was an end user of some sort. There were application developers and deployers. Um, there were, in a primitive form at that time, um, devel de development and deployment platform administrators. Um, and infrastructure administrators. So my group that I managed were the infrastructure administrators. And to some extent, we were platform administrators. Most of the people that I served were application developers and end users, a combo. Some of them, those that got tenure fastest, were just end users. <laughs> they were theoretical computer scientists that did complexity theory and, and um, they're, they used email and the printer. But then there were a range of people. Some people wanted root on their own workstations. So they were their own infrastructure administrators as well. I want to focus for a minute on the application developer persona, uh, persona and think about OpenStack and Kubernetes and other uh, container orchestrators in light of that personality, that person, persona, not personality. So OpenStack came along 
And the promise basically there is you could get infrastructure without having to wait on service tickets. So, and you could have shared infrastructure with multi-tenancy. So you had an infrastructure of various sorts as a service and different tenants in OpenStack could get VMs typically and the storage they needed to work with them and the network thing they wanted to work with, needed to work with them and all the other resources um, from a big shared pool of infra and they'd be ships in the night to each other. And instead of back, like when I worked at the UC labs, them having to file a ticket with me to get me to go file inf figure out how to get them some more storage or how to get them more compute or more networking or whatever, you can do it yourself. That was the big promise. It worked out pretty well at that level. But most of the people in they want to solve problems that they just want to make apps that solve problems without basically having to learn to be a system administrator. Some people do, but to use OpenStack right now, you need to know how to work with the networking to request networks and create your own network. You need to know how to work with uh, the storage provision or sender. You need to know how to work with Neutron. You need to know how to work with Nova, et cetera. And OpenStack isn't totally simple to learn how to use. So do you really want to have to learn to be a system admin just to solve problems? Some people do. A lot of people don't. So if you think about it, with OpenStack, you've got to be the application developer. You've got to, if you have some kind of development platform, you've got to do that for yourself. And you're half of an infrastructure administrator. You get a simplified, abstracted infrastructure, right? You can say, I need four CPUs, and I need, um, um, I need two terabytes of disk, et cetera, and you don't have to worry about details. But you're still pro provisioning infrastructure once you get that um, you know, you say, I want, a, I want a Linux system. Uh, I want a CentOS system or, a, or an Ubuntu system or whatever. Once you get that, you've got to install the packages, build everything up yourself. So as an application developer, why do you have to do all these things? So enter container orchestrators as an alternative. Containers give you... Um, a way to package applications so you can run them anywhere on any Linux system. Um, you got fast iterative de deployment. I'm not going to repeat all this stuff. You, you, you'll hear the container propaganda all over the place this week. It's got, I said propaganda, but there's, it's true, right? And you don't have to concern yourself with provisioning infrastructure. But they need orchestration. So, you know, can't just make Docker containers by themselves and, and, uh, without, and be actual, actually be able to deploy things at any scale. So you need to be able to deploy, update, monitor health, restart if they die, et cetera, et cetera. That's where container con orchestrators like Kubernetes come in. And there are a variety of them. Um, we have OpenShift as an extension of Kubernetes. So. If you think in terms of the container orchestrators, they're ad addressing this level of application developer and platform administrator, right? And so the, the, the cloud admin is the platform administrator and the cloud user is the application developer. But that bottom layer wasn't colored in there. Containers do need infrastructure as well. They need uh, compute nodes to run on. And they need storage. In particular, as you will hear or heard during the Rook talk and so on, but many applications that can benefit from containerization need to save state and volumes that have a different life cycle than the containers themselves. They'll persist beyond it. The container can go down and come back, and it'll still be there. There was a early days of uh, container Kool-Aid 
uh, people looked at some apps which don't need that and said the world's going to go that way. Um, interesting. I think that's because that was a GIF that of the OpenShift service catalog. And it's a cool picture. Um, what it shows you is that if you look at the OpenStack service catalog, how many of the things you can choose out, uh, OpenShift service catalog, how many of the things you can pick out of the catalog have the word persistent written next to them in parentheses? About, about four out of five. And then you look at the things that don't have persistent written to them, and there are things you say, oh, yeah, that would make a great uh, NGINX without persistence. Oh, I would take that and then figure out how to do the persistence myself as the next container layer on it and save it as a new container. Uh, almost everything that's popular in there, with some exceptions, I mean, you can run Cassandra without it, and you can, there are things you can do. I guess next time I'll have a static image of it, but it was nice because it paged through and just showed you persistent, persistent, persistent. Okay, what's RWX storage? I mean, it's a jargon. Read, write, many is Kubernetes terminology, but I didn't know last year. Then I started getting all these requests from our product managers saying, we need RWX storage for OpenShift. Sender's not going to do it. Blocks are not going to do it. So I had to look up what RWX read, write, many storage is. Um, this is from the Kubernetes official definition. But basically, it's what file storage can give you, right? Um, now, there's a subtlety in there that I'll cover in just a second. But basically, you can mount it multiple times and write to it from multiple writers. Now, the subtlety here is that in the case I'm talking about, the applications writing do not have to know about one another. They do not have to cooperate with one another. There's a file system doing write arbitration. It's a network file system rather than a local node file system. If you look at, this is again from the Kubernetes doc, you look there, CephFS can do it, RBD does not. NFS does it, sender does not, um, et cetera. Now, the subtlety here is that in the last, um, last version of, of, well, we've recently added raw block storage as well. And what that accommodates with raw block, block devices can do read, write, many storage. In, technical sense at least. But what it means is basically the applications running on the multiple mounts cooperate with one another and arrange when they're going to write to disk themselves or they have some kind of uh, um, Kubernetes isn't, uh, and the other container orchestrators are not going to provide you with a clustered file system that's going to do that for, for you. Um, so there are some database applications, there are various cases, but you would be writing to raw blocks and you would be coordinated among yourselves. We're talking about general purpose RWX storage. Enter, uh, I'm going to talk a minute about the container storage interface. So, when Kubernetes first started adding storage, they added an entry. And they added, um, so it was part of the Kubernetes code, code base. Um, it was statically provisioned. So you would do a persistent volume claim that would point to a persistent volume where the persistent volume was made for you by the cloud administrator in advance. So unlike the self-service model that I was just talking about in OpenStack, they didn't have that. Um, so it was entry, it was um, static. Um, next, they introduced the idea of dynamic provisioning. So you would point to a um, storage class, and the storage class would dynamically provision the volumes for you. Um, 
and they move stuff out of tree so that the development of plugins for um, the for different kinds of storage could be done in a life cycle outside of Kubernetes itself. Um, that had advantages because you didn't have to wait, you know, w you didn't have to do the equivalent of getting, you know, waiting for Linus to approve your patch in the kernel in order to make, uh, thank you. Just water. In order to, um, thank you in order to make the changes. Allegedly, it's just water. We'll see. Hey, that tastes good. Um, then we had, um, we, we now have the next coming, to, coming thing, which are CSI drivers. So they're going to be out of tree. So they're external, they're dynamic, um, and they're written to work with any kind of uh, container orchestrator. So you get cooperation from people outside the Kubernetes uh, community as well in terms of developing it. Now, um, so CSI is kind of where it's at in terms of new development and new features. So you have things like, um, snapshot support and topology awareness and so on that are being added for CSI um, drivers and plugins um, that are not there even with the external flex file stuff yet and probably won't be because the development's shifting towards CSI. Um, you have support in Kubernetes uh, so that you just need to write a volume driver for your back end and plug it in, um, and there will be proxy containers and, and the stuff that you need in Kubernetes to work with it already there. Um, so here's a table just showing when things are ready uh, in terms of versions of CSI. Seth? has a CSI backend plugin. This is Ceph, in case you haven't seen it before. I've, uh, what I did to this uh, diagram that you've seen a thousand times is write RWO and RWX over block and write the same thing with RWX over the file service. Again, with the caveat that if you run the block storage in the non-default new raw block mode, you can run it RWX there too, and it's on you to make sure you don't corrupt your data. You have to write, you know, and you, you know, so you're typically going to have a specialized app, the same app running on both nodes, that app talking, you know, coordinating among themselves and figuring out how they're going to do writes. Whereas RWX with a file system, the apps don't have to know anything about each other, they get a network file system, um, and uh, they got, you know, POSIX and namespaces and permissions and all the, all the regular stuff you're used to. Typically, in, in Kubernetes with, um, with block storage, including RBD, if you run with the default mode, what happens right away is that a file system is created on that raw block mode for you. It's a node local file system and should only be mounted once. And you can say, well, could it be mounted more than once on the same node? Could that be safe? In Kubernetes, you never know where, you never know that you're going to be on the same node or not. You're somewhere in a cluster. So um, still not the right mini case anyway. Um, so there's a place and a big demand um, for this RWX storage from our customers, people asking for it. If you think about the use cases, um, you got a bunch of containers. They want to write log files to the same place. Or you got a bunch of uh, um, data collection workers, Internet of Things, or financial transactions, point of sales, or whatever. Each of them wants to write it into their own little spot in the shared file system so that aggregation programs can come along and collect the data and mush it together and send it off somewhere else, maybe back up that data. Uh, there's there's ton, uh, pipelines 
where you've got pipeline, you know, pipelines of processing transcoding or something like that. And you p pass it from this worker to this worker to this worker to this worker, and you persist along the way so that if you, if you die, you don't lose your work. Um, I can go on, but anyway, there are a lot of, lots of use cases for having many container workloads being able to write to the same file store. Okay, so there is the Ceph CSI um, um, for RBD. Um, and there's a little pattern here you see, which is you deploy these sidecar containers. The provisioner part, which um, creates the backend volume, runs as a stateful set so that you can run exactly one of them in your cluster. And on the nodes where, basic, where, where mounting may occur, you run as a daemon set. So you're running one on every minion node that, that can do the mounts. Um, there's a Ceph CSI for uh, CephFS. And same pattern here. I've skipped, if you look at this web page, there's one paragraph above that wouldn't fit where you create the uh, RBOC for your, for your container. Um, it looks very similar, works similarly. Rook will do this for you too. I mean, interact with this. Uh, right now it's FlexFile, but it's gonna, gonna be the CSI shortly. If, if, uh, if the uh, PRs that are going by that I look at tell me anything. Um, so infrastructure like this, um, you need it, even in the container world. And either you're going to rent it or you buy and manage it. And if you rent it, you should probably rent it from somebody you trust, like you know, your own company, bigger <laughs> IT department or something, you probably, somebody that will give you your data back <laughs> or not charge you an arm and leg to get it back. And if you buy and manage it, then you better be able to have enough scale and have to be able to do that yourself. So one tendency I see that's not, not universal by any means um, is that people, you know, like, Individual small departments of an organization want to run their own container orchestrator clouds. And I mean, there's exceptions to this. And the larger organization wants to manage shared infrastructure because of the economies that gives um, so that the, so that basically what I'm saying here is that in many cases it may make sense to have um, a central organization run the complicated infrastructure cloud and then support multiple small container orchestrator clouds since lots of the end users want to interact with the container orchestrator cloud rather than uh, infrastructure. And of course, there are exceptions to all this. So, so in that ki kind of situation, We've already got here a little bit, um, we got the application developer and who would define a PVC using Kubernetes, referencing a storage class saying, I need a volume, I need it to be 200 gigabytes, and um, that's about all I need to tell you, you know. And it would, refer, it would point at a storage class that, that says that, but the storage class would then point to a provisioner. So it can point to a CephFS provisioner, it can point to other kinds of provisioning. That would dynamically create the volume, but then that's, uh, that's gotta come from somewhere, and it's gonna come, an administra infrastructure administrator is going to provide the CephFS storage that this comes from and manage that. What about Manila? So I work on Manila. Manila provides scalable storage infrastructure, freedom of choice, and multi-tenancy. So what do I mean? In this world, by the way, the infrastructure administrator, instead of just being a, a CephFS administrator, is a uh, OpenStack administrator or a Manila administrator working outside of OpenStack proper um, that can serve storage via CephFS, via CephFS, 
um, CephFS via NFS, or other kinds of storage that Manila can support. Manila has about 35 different backends that are, uh, it can handle. So CephFS is my favorite backend. Some people don't have the luxury of working in a uh, shop or whatever, a IT shop where only their favorite backend is deployed. They may need to make use of expensive vendor-wise backend and rather than letting it sit idle. Manila can sit as an abstraction layer between the container orchestrator and the infrastructure and allow use of both. They can appear as different storage classes up, up, up above. You can give them to, some people can pay for the expensive storage, some people can't, don't, and so on. Manila supports a bunch of fi um, file share protocols. Uh, I don't have HDFS up there, that's an, or um, native um, GPFS, but there are a bunch of them as well. It's integrated into OpenStack. So if you do run OpenStack already or are interested in running OpenStack, it integrates into it. It's a vital, it's a part of it. It's down bottom right. I got a little blue around it. However, oh, and it provides this multi-tenancy that we were talking about earlier. So that tenant A and tenant B um, don't really know about each other. They're separated off from one another, and they can still get at the storage. It has a very pretty simple service architecture, and actually, contrary to what a lot of people would think from it coming from OpenStack, it really doesn't, it's loosely coupled with the rest of OpenStack. It's only hard dependencies are having a messaging bus, which is typically RabbitMQ these days, and a de SQL database, typically MySQL or Postgres or something like that. If you want multi-tenancy, then you need to run it with interacting with Keystone. Keystone can have plugins as well. Because um, the notion of the different projects that you belong to as a tenant come from Keystone. It has a robust deployment with, um, with Ceph, with, um, with Triple O. We can deploy it as a native CephFS native, and we can do it with an NFS gateway. We are looking, as talk, implicit at least in the previous talk, at moving towards running the Ceph daemons and Ganesha externally to OpenStack proper, and using um, running Ganesha Demons active active and actually being able to, they talked about spinning them up per subtree. We can tie client, uh, sub volume, we can tie clients to sub volumes or potentially to separate uh, file systems down the road and give them separate Ganesha gateways. And then we would um, tie them in to tenant private networks. So basically, there'd be a nice complete illusion of having your own server and your own network and own storage without any um, interference with anybody else. An important point about Manila is from a consumption point of view, Manila doesn't care if the client mounting the share is a VM or hardware. It doesn't care if the VM was provisioned by OpenStack, that is, it's a Nova instance, or an ironic instance, hardware provisioned by OpenStack, or if it was provisioned outside OpenStack. And it certainly doesn't care if that um, client is reserving those uh, up to containers, to container workloads. So you see here pictures where con uh, containers, bare metal, virtual machines are mixed with Manila open in, uh, uh, Manila's tenancy model so that we can segregate out by tenant, but that's orthogonal to the question of what type of client is consuming. I drew here 
one of the previous pictures substituting OpenStack VMs with OpenShift clusters or Kubernetes clusters or some other container orchestrator clusters. So in this kind of picture, the container orchestrator, the platform as a service cluster, is the OpenStack user. And they are, that, that is the administrator of the container orchestrator cluster is an OpenStack ship OpenStack user. And then they have their own users. And then they, they're, who are developers and deployers, who have their own users, who are application users. So for Manila, there's a Manila CSI plugin that can be used just like the CFFS plugin that we talked about earlier. It's developed, actually, by folks at CERN. Interesting. OK. That was a picture of the GitHub repo that shows the pull request that Robert Vashek, who is working at CERN and is a grad, full-time graduate student right now, and who has a Google Summer of Code um, fellowship for this summer to continue his work, is doing to um, create the CSI interface for Manila. Um, it has a stage, a provisioning stage, uh, when there's a create volume request from CSI, it authenticates with a Manila client, creates um, I'm illustrating the CFFS case right now, uh, CFFS share and an access rule for it. He's right now, uh, he just pushed the change to NFS as well as CFFS. So we'll have NFS and CFFS kind of probably by the time this PR merges. Other protocols could be added by other people who are interested down the road. Um, and then um, on the nodes, the way it's going to work actually is by a proxy. I, I kind of ran over the picture earlier where there's a Unix socket. There's, there's, some, there's a plugin that Kubernetes supplies that's listening uh, in a, a kubelet um, on the nodes. And then it hands off to the um, CSI backend specific CSI plugin through a Unix socket. He's actually kind of repeating that step once as the Manila there will be a Manila plugin um, that then hands off to the CFFS one for CFFS or to CSI, uh, CSI NFS for NFS. So the node, uh, node provi not provisioning, the node state publishing part uh, actually involves using uh, a secondary CSI plugin as well. Um, and again, there's this pattern with the stateful set for the provisioner and um, daemon set for the, for the node-specific stuff. So what are we doing? Um, I, when I went to um, the Berlin OpenStack Summit, I was planning on uh, having my group write a Manila CSI plugin. Uh, we heard a talk by Robert and Ricardo Roca at, uh, from CERN on what, how they were already, um, already basically starting to do it. They were using the uh, dynamic external provisioner for the provisioning side with Manila in combination with the CFFS CSI. Um, similar model to what we had, and they, they were planning on replacing the dynamic provisioner with the CSI provisioner. So we said, that's just what we wanted anyway. Uh, so what's left for us to do <laughs> over, uh, um, if, if CERN's going to do this? Uh, besides reviewing the PRs and, and so on, we're trying to set up um, something so we can do end-to-end -end testing on it, because the, the, the upstream um, stuff in cloud provider OpenStack where this is merging. Basically does some unit tests and some 
uh, rudimentary integration tests, but we want to turn this into a product that we can ship. Uh, so we want some, a full, full integration testing. I was uh, struck by um, uh, James Blair's talk, two talks earlier. Uh, he's actually set up a, a cluster like I'm describing here um, quite independently. Um, but we're also using Ansible playbooks. I'm going to go look at what he's doing because it may be better and borrow from it. Um, but we, we are also setting up a Kubernetes cluster uh, using Ansible. It's also using OpenStack nodes to run on. Mine was developed from uh, Louis Pabon's stuff with Libvirt for deploying um, um, Kubernetes clusters, not what he's done. We set up a full environment there for uh, building so we can pull in the patch sets and build the latest stuff, a nice Go development environment. Um, and in there, we actually deploy Manila on one of the worker nodes. Um, and we're not deploying anything else in OpenStack except Manila and Keystone, just like that little picture I did, so that we can do end-to-end -end tests with this. Um, after we get that working end-to-end, -end, um, and it's close, he, I've got to pull in the latest patch that he just pushed uh, while I was flying out here. Um, we, want, we want to deploy Ceph externally with Rook. So right now we're using OpenStack DevStack to, to deploy a little tiny Ceph, toy Ceph cluster that we can interact with. And we can, um, you, we can exercise it both with the Ganesha gateway and as native. Um, so we'll pull out that part where we're deploying Ceph that way, use Rook to deploy it and to deploy Ganesha in line with uh, Patrick and Jeff's talk. And that's the next thing we want to do. And then I want to play, uh, we, we want to kind of test out robustly some HA scenarios because currently we use Pacemaker internally with OpenStack to manage Ganesha. And we want to make sure it works nicely uh, with Kubernetes HA. Uh, and then um, we'll, um, we actually want to, this relates to a question you may not have heard from the previous one where Patrick asked about Courier. Uh, that's two times ago. But we want to use Courier and add that in there so that we can do this per tenant service from Ganesha back to separate tenants. So each tenant gets a separate set of Ganesha servers. So each of them can scale out from one to many Ganesha servers um, for each tenant. And um, so these are areas of research that we're doing, integrating these things that other people are building. Um, if you're, I don't know why I have this little thing down here. The slides will be posted, and there's a URL right here, pardon me, um, that shows um, where, where we're putting our Ansible playbooks there. If you have an OpenStack cloud, um, you can run it against that yourself. Um, if you don't, you can probably make a libvirt based um, branch of it that you can run on your notebook. That's how I started doing this. Um, so in summary, we're moving full steam ahead to integrate Manila CSI for Kubernetes um, from OpenStack to integrate those. Um, we're trying to bring in more CSI features. Um, that Robert's working on this summer, snapshot support, volume extension, topology. Manila already has these. It's a matter of figuring out how to expose them to the CSI so that the container orchestrators can take advantage of them. Um, we are exploring running Ceph and Ganesha daemons under Kubernetes control, scaling out Ganesha services per tenant. Uh, we're looking at network isolation pulling um, networks back in from the daemons deployed by Kubernetes into per-tenant private networks using Courier. Um, we're also, I didn't really mention this, actively investing, investigating scaled down hyperconverged deployments with Manila. That's part of the reason I'm just deploying, a, I'm interested in deploying Manila by itself without the rest of OpenStack. This will be useful for um, scenarios where you need to support multiple backends 
so you have to support an EMC or a NetApp or something uh, for your container orchestrator, as well as CephFS. Um, and um, if you're running one-to-one, -one, so you only have one container orchestrator and one infrastructure layer, um, then you don't need Keystone. You've only got one tenant, so we'll look at running without it as well. And then, again, I really want to put the rubber to the road on, on using Kubernetes stateful sets uh, for HA availability. Um, both for Ganesha, it was discussed previously, and also for the Manila Share service itself, which is currently managed by Pacemaker. Um, so we, we'd like to be able to get rid Pacemaker's a little bit heavy machinery, especially for the hyperconverged scenarios. Um, that's it. Um, all right. I, I guess we might have a little time for questions, or I might have run over. Anybody have questions? Might be tapas time. OK, thank you, everybody. I, I'll be around to find me pretty easily. <laughs>